What is up, guys? Welcome to another episode of the Smart Flip Phone Flippers Podcast, uh, hosted by me, myself, and Matt at you. Matthew, Matt, my gosh. Can't even talk to you. I've already done a full day's worth of work, and it's like I can't talk anymore. <laughs> I just onboarded somebody in the accelerator this morning. It was, you know, you know how it is, Matt. <laughs> so, um, let's, uh, so, guys, we've got a guest today. Um, somebody who's been in the industry since I've been since I was eight years old, um, so long time before I ever jumped in. Uh, but today we have JJ Brown. Um, super excited to bring him on here. Um, he's been in the industry for a long time. A lot of people who've been in the industry a long time probably recognize him. And um, we got him here today. I want to talk a little bit about his story and kind of uh, open up to what kind of resources he has for flippers, resellers, and I think you even help a couple of local businesses and stuff too. Um, I think I heard you talk about that a couple of times, JJ. So um, with that being said, guys, welcome to the Smart Flip. Let's get started. And uh, JJ, dude, let's start from the beginning. Like how, how did you get into the, the phone flipping, buyback space? You know, let's start from the very beginning and go from there. Uh, I was probably in high school when cell phones came out. So the first ones, those Nokia's that could break a car, you know, um, yeah. started getting those, uh, getting used ones, broken ones, putting them back together. Uh, then the touchscreen ones came out and that became a much bigger deal. Uh, really got into the business with the Blackberry and the scroll ball, you know, that take that one out, put a new one in. And uh, I was bartending, working in restaurants during all that time. And I started to realize that I could make a lot more money at my kitchen table than I could through tips. So um kind of transitioned uh haven't had a job in any other industry in the last almost 25 years coming up on so it's been a while yeah uh, from there i opened the first repair shop in phoenix uh that's phoenix arizona right and we scaled that up to four or five stores at one point uh we were one of the first lcd buyback companies in the country so if you had a broken screen in the early 2000s there's a pretty good chance it came through my business we moved several million screens through there I uh, had 70 employees. We were just dialing and smiling, calling everybody in the country. Um, hopefully my connection's okay. I'm out here in the Northwest, but uh, yeah, it really- It'll just clear up. Uh, it's all good. Yeah, you're good. Perfect. Yeah, so I started at the repair shops, built those up in Phoenix. Uh, started going national with B2B with our LCD buyback business. Did that for a long time. Um, trade wars kind of started happening and then it's just a big business, so I just kind of switched over to what I love instead. We sold that off, and now I'm just doing software and really anything on the internet that helps businesses get where they need to go. Been doing that for the last several years. Cool. Love that. So, so you started with the BlackBerry. Did you ever do like the phone flipping part, or was it I more was, like on the repair side? I was doing it quite a bit back then, but it was just local. You know, I didn't know about any of the national guys or going international or anything like that. It was just uh, buying some broken phones and putting them back together. We were doing that with uh, game consoles, too. Uh, we actually had a lot of fun with it. We were taking apart Xboxes back in the 360 days, and we were building nice. them into different things. So I built this guitar that would light up. So when the, you know, the Xbox has got the ring that goes up, instead the frets would light up on the guitar, and the CD <laughs> would slide off the side. It was pretty cool. So we did a lot of custom stuff like that, but... Um, the clientele just seemed a little bit more advanced with the cell phones, especially when the iPhone came out. So we got rid of all the video game stuff, doubled down on cellular, got into tablets, and spent a whole bunch of time up in that space for a while. It was good. Love that. So I want to ask this question. Like, when the iPhone first came out, like, obviously I was, like, not old. I was in middle school, I think. Um, so, like, what was that like industry-wide? Like, I'm kind of curious. It was a wild west. It was insane. You know, uh, the phones would come out, they'd be six, you know, 600 bucks, but they'd be a thousand dollars because you couldn't get them. Everybody wanted it. So the markup was insane. Uh, then you'd have the broken phones that you wouldn't really get very much for. So we'd realize, okay, with the broken phones, we need parts. So we started an eBay store. We turned into a pretty big parts business from there for a while with hookup cellular, uh, selling parts all over the country. Uh, and that's when the LCD buyback got into the business too. Wow. Okay. So it was big industry around the iPhones as soon as it came out. Uh, hard to get. 
Um, and then, it, you know, everything start, sort of like followed suit behind the iPhone, I'm assuming, uh, with, this, with the, the touch screens and everything. I remember whenever I first bought my first touch screen Android, I, I do remember that. Um, that was wild. <laughs> like this brand new thing. And now it's just, it's the norm, which is it's very interesting. Over the world. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone's staring at their screens. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> so, um, so I want to transition here a little bit. So we got the story, um, and you said you were, you were a bartender. That's right. Yeah. Love that dude. I came from the serving industry too. That's so cool. <laughs> I was waiting tables for, you know, while I was flipping my phones at the same time. So I think a lot of people relate with those stories a lot. Um, so I want to transition, like, I want to know how you went from the hardware aspect of things to the software, like, were you already pretty intuitive when it came to the like online stuff, uh, spreadsheets, things like that? Or was that something you really had to like dig in, learn, put the time? I mean, I mean, I'm assuming you had to put the time in. I've seen your spreadsheet builds. They're wild. <laughs> but like, where did that part of things come from? I went to school to be an accountant. I wanted to be either a business lawyer or a CPA. And that was uh, around the time that the smartphones were coming out is when I was in college. So I realized tuition just kept going up and I switched. I said, all right, let's just do business instead. And that's when we opened up our stores. And then I realized you really need to pay attention to what's going on with the money, you know, and make sure that all of that makes sense. So that's where the spreadsheets came in. After we figured out where the money was, you got to figure out how the leads come in. So that's where the web, you know, all of the Internet things, Google ads, Facebook ads, uh, SEO, all of that stuff. Uh, so I was the guy in charge of that in the company, and that was really my gig, my drive to go through it all. And I think the big inspiration with it was uh, when you've got 70 employees and several thousand SKUs, it's stressful. And when you have software, you don't have any of those things. It's not as stressful. So it was just a natural jump to take the skills that I learned from putting all of those things together to really just kind of helping everybody else that has those things to make them better for themselves. I love that. That's awesome. Matt, do you have any like burning questions on this? I know you yeah, I'm, it, but. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious, like, um, is it, like I always, I love hearing people's stories and I always love to um, kind of hear about the, the big things for me are kind of like the transitions because some people uh, don't struggle to start small, but they do struggle to scale. And like, you know, a lot of people we talk to, uh, even before they even, taste a little bit of success they start asking big questions well how can i make ten thousand dollars how can i make fifteen thousand dollars and they haven't made like fifteen hundred and um it's interesting because it's like you know you're taking a bite way bigger than what your body's able to absorb right now you haven't like you haven't gamed up to that level so i'm curious like as you were kind of growing through this process like what like you don't just go from zero to 70 employees that's a pretty serious growth track so maybe could we could, could you talk about that a little bit like what um at what points do you feel like we're like critical growth moments like in your business and what do you feel like that um what do you feel like was necessary for you to like learn to kind of like manage those turns if i could say it like that empathy i think that's the answer to all of it if you're worried about numbers you're in the wrong business you should be concerned about people. You want to make sure that whoever it is you're working with or whoever's working for you, you understand them, you understand what their problem is or what their goal is, and you help them to get there. Uh, that's not dollars. Dollars come. That's the wind. The wind's going to change. But the stronger the wind, the better. You know what I'm saying? So you really want to focus on the relationships. And, you know, when you get a deal, you want that person to come back. You want them to remember how you made them feel. They don't care about the dollars. I mean, you can make money. People don't feel good spending money. They feel good having solutions. Uh, they feel good, you know, being risen up through different things. So empathy, I think, is the key word at any point in scaling. And then after that, it comes back to the accounting and making sure that the numbers are right so that you know when you can make that next step. Because if you're thinking about the next step, you haven't, you got to be in, in the present moment. What's working good there? And then when you're ready, you invest for something new. You can use motivation to go forward, but you really don't want to take those steps until you have the assets in place to do it. Yeah. 
I like that. There's um, there's some time tested advice that I can I can I can hear it. I can, but I can feel it. It's palatable, and uh, I appreciate the uh, the solidarity with which you said that because I can tell like there were some lessons where you probably learned uh, to see people more as people and less as uh, just solutions to your problems. And I feel like that is something that it's so easy to step over the next body, you know, to get to the piece of profit. But I, what I hear you saying is that if, if that is your intention and people becomes a means to an end, then your business is going to struggle um, unless you start to see the, the value of relational equity and like grow, essentially what you're saying is, you know, don't, don't grow it just, you know, for dollar's sake, like grow it with your people. And uh, I freaking love that because like for me, like connecting, like making sure people see, are seen and heard um, is really important to me as an individual. And uh, I think Chris does a fantabulous job with this as well. Uh, but to hear somebody who, you know, with a lot of battle tested experience say that, um, man, it just brings a lot of joy to my face. So that, that was fantastic. Thank you, JJ. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's a good question. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I totally agree with that. You want to build the company based on people rather than the profit sometimes, because sometimes the profit won't be there in that, let's say month, but the people will be right. A lot of people, you know, we've, we've had that, like we've had, you know, and I've had talks with Matt too, with Recelerator. There's been some months that, you know, have just not been good. <laughs> you know, it's, it's kind of the same with like flipping phones and stuff like that. You know, a lot of people, they'll focus heavily on the numbers and not, you know, the human capital that they have. Right. Like, like I set our business up with Recelerator specifically so that Matt and Aaron and my team win, even when I'm losing, like I set it up specifically to be that way. Um, but you know, if they're winning, I'm winning big, you know? So, well, what do you do with profits? You invested in people. It's either ads or it's, employees you know so the profits are for the people in one way or the other it's it's an empathy business you know we're not a manufacturing business we want to make mm -hmm. sure that we're it's all relationships yeah 100 mm -hmm. percent. yeah love that um, i would uh if i could if i could ask another question jj i would love to hear like i find that like entrepreneurship or being a business owner however people want to frame it it's 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 constantly inviting like a what seems like a your revolving door of problem solving. Um, and I'm curious, like what has sort of been like, what, what's your take on approach? Like when you run into like, you know, for starters, like just, just nuances that you realize, okay, this is a problem. I'm the person most empowered to solve it. Let me, let me figure this out. Like, how do you, like, what's your mindset and approach to um, issues when they arise and problems that need to be solved or fixed? Uh, hopefully connections coming through here. Can you guys hear me good right now? Yeah, I can great. Mm -hmm. Cool, cool. Uh, all right. So when I was younger, it was run right at the wall. Let's fix it right away. Uh, <laughs> that caused problems. <laughs> so I've learned from there. There's really two stages to it. You've got the problem, which is going to create an emotional response, and then you've got the brainstorming and the problem solving, which comes after that. So what I always like to advise is if you're if you're in that emotional phase, don't take any action. Think about it for a minute because you're going to have a better solution in time than you would right away. So I, a lot of times people will get frustrated, like, there's a problem. What are we supposed to do? And I'll say, hang on, maybe take a sip of water, you know, think about it a second. <laughs> yeah. Or if anything, just say, that's, that's a good challenge. Let me get back to you. Uh, and then from there, you're really going to formulate a better response for what you're trying to do. Or some new idea may come to mind that doesn't, in the instant, you run into the wall. I have a rule around this, actually, like whenever a problem happens or a an idea happens, I and Matt knows this. I have resorted to not making decisions on the weekends at all. Um, and there's a reason for that, because every time I've made a decision on a weekend, whether it's a problem or a new idea, it almost has always failed. <laughs> it's because, like, I'm not in the like. I'm not in the state where I need to be making decisions, you know, like, like by Friday, my brain is absolutely fried by the end of the week. Like it's done. Um, so I, I, I need the days to recharge. Um, like I'll still work a little bit 
if I do work on the weekends, it's more like busy work. Uh, the stuff I got to do, catching up on the numbers, stuff like that. Um, but I, re I like that, you know, you don't make the decisions when you're emotional. I also just don't make the decisions when I'm not in the decision making mode, I guess. <laughs> um, it's been, a, it's always been kind of an issue for me is just making decisions too quickly. And I like, I like what you said there. I was just putting my kind of the way I do it personally. And that could change, honestly. I'm only 29. Who knows? You know, what's your decision making process like nowadays, JJ? I know you said emotional. You know, don't make it, don't make decisions when you're emotional. But what are what are the decision making events or processes that you kind of frameworked out over time? It kind of comes back to the same fundamentals. Maybe you're not emotional, but you got a great idea. Give yourself some time because it could sprout more, you know. So, hey, you've got a response and you want to impress whoever you're talking to with an instant solution. Uh, but you may have a better solution coming through mm. if you just give yourself another 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. I, I think uh, that that is helps a... too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Working out definitely helps. It's very clearing of the mind. Yeah, I agree. I, I hear... Um, you know, the world seems to, Chris and I, um, we, have a, we have a pretty decent majority age range within our group, but I'd say large and in part, like a lot of our students, some of them are younger. And I think for some of them, there's an impression sometimes that they have to, they have to get wealthy like now. You know, we've got people um, to reiterate that will jump in and, and already, you know, 30 days in think, okay, you like, I need to, they'll have seen like a, some sort of interview with somebody who's making like, I don't know, 20 grand a month. And, you know, they're immediately going, okay, like, how do I get there? Like, they're very like, response and results driven. And what I like is I hear, is I hear, I hear a timeliness, like I hear a, uh, um, a, a kind of a, a, a pacing uh, within your voice uh, within your posture and within your responses that I want to kind of, I, I just kind of want to like dig into that for a second, because like, um, what would you say to the people who are like, okay, um, I'm starting to flip now. I'm start. I'm a reseller officially. Uh, I need to let me get wealthy as fast as I can. Like, what do you think is like some just really sound advice for people that are starting that want to make their money, but, um, what would, what would you say they should consider before they just start sprinting as hard as they can in that direction? Okay. I like, I always go back in that like case. I love what you said there, like the pay yourself first type thing. Um, <clears throat> I always go back to the richest man in Babylon, you know, 10% is mine to keep. And, and that's where the wealth is built over time. It's just in that 10%, like 90% always goes to something else, right? Bills, business, all of that stuff. But 10% is mine to keep. And I think that's a that's a smart way to, to roll because if you, if you take this and you look at it like let's say from a phone for Bruce stance like let's say they make eighty dollars eighty dollars in profit off of a flip taking eight dollars out of that and putting it into a savings is not hard but most people won't do it <laughs> but that's where the wealth is built it's right there right and you know I can't say I'm the best at it yet but I am working on it. Um, but I always remember that in the back of my head. And I like what you said there. Just 
always wealth building assets, things like that are what's necessary. Yeah. So it's awesome. So um, I want to talk a little bit about your, your softwares, your, uh, the things you've built, like what, I don't even know how much you offer. Um, so I, I'd like to highlight that a, a little bit here because we'll obviously put your stuff in the description in the first comment on YouTube. Um, like what all do you offer to like phone flippers, resellers? I know you do the IMEI thing, the buyback website stuff. And is there anything else on top of that? Is that all? Is that oh, okay? Good. No, nah, go ahead. I mean, those. I mean, I've used both of those things, and they're great. And obviously, we use it with Mercury Electronics right now, um, as well, which makes the whole process way easier. Um, that's why I connected you in here, and I was like, I'm not doing this. <laughs> 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 I already got enough stuff I work on. Um, I hear that. Yeah, for real, right? So, um, and then I have played with the IMEI checker. The IMEI checker is great. I need to play with it more, honestly. Um, but like, I usually know my offer before I have, you know, uh, just muscle memory at this point. Um, right. But is there anything else on top of that, or are those the two main things right now? Yes. Yeah. Oh, fuck. <laughs> Missed that one, man. Nice. So if you're looking for a buyback website, it's already pre-built, guys. You guys can reach out to JJ on that. Um, we do have a differing philosophy on this a little bit. I don't, I don't make offers before we talk to them. <laughs> but you can do it either way. Um, either way works. Um, I just prefer to talk to the client first, personally. Um, I've just had, in my opinion, it's, I've had better success. Um, but.
Oh, you cut out there for a second. You're cutting out a little bit, JJ. Hello? <laughs> He's outside. He's outside, so I'm not sure how good his connection is. Can you hear us? Um, hold on. One sec. Let me turn off your camera here. It might be hindering it a little bit. Can you hear us now? Oh, there you are. You're good. Oh, well, we lost him. I don't, I didn't catch what he said. <laughs> He'll probably be back on in a minute. But uh, yeah, if you guys want, you guys can reach out to JJ. He's on pretty much all the socials under JJ Brown. He's got uh, stacks.tools, I think is his website. Um, great guy. Dude is super uh, quick on communication. Uh, which is always a good and a big plus whenever, especially for me personally. Um, I prefer people to talk to me and not, you know, wait 24 or 48 hours to talk to me, especially when I'm paying them. So <laughs> yeah. um, what were you saying, Matt? Oh, no, just agreeing. <laughs> yeah, let me see if I can get them on. We'll get them back on shortly. But, yeah, you guys can find him on JJ. Um, I personally use his, his – uh, I'm actually running ads to one of his websites right now for Google Ads. And uh, having okay results. We've switched up the website a couple of times. Um, it is more now uh, – makes – offers them a price. And, but if it doesn't offer the – like, it depends on how they go through the process, I guess. Um but like we we've, we've moved it more now to get contact information first before revealing a price, um, which is you know something I've I've looked at in the past and I think JJ was alluding to it is you you'll get more people if you don't give the price away right away, um, and like you don't want to totally remove the negotiation side of things because if you do you'll lose a lot and I've seen this in data like you can literally see from page to page to page click throughs. And then you'll literally see like, like if you see a hundred click throughs to the offer page, you'll see like three to like the, the reach out to us page, like where they can put in their information. And um, it's, it's like low in my opinion. Um, I like to have more like a 40% conversion on getting contact information that way I can keep it, follow up, do all of that stuff, lead generation. Yeah. So, um, let's see if I can get him back on here. I'm not sure what happened. But yeah. Um, Matt, was there anything that stood out to you, man? Yeah. I think um, you just, you understand like what, one thing I love about um, his sensibility is he, he doesn't seem like he's in a hurry. Um, he's, he's thinking about things. Um, he's thinking about things in a, with a, with a level of calculated risk. And, um, I think, you know, to be able to have somebody who says, oh yeah, you know, there's a young millionaire. He's probably doing pretty okay now financially too, um, is taking that, that level of anxiety that some people have about, you know, they're chomping at the bit to start reselling. And feel like they have to like make money so quickly, and it's like, yeah, but you can, we like you can use a program like ours, and we can help you scale into that. Or like, but you don't have to become wealthy overnight to become wealthy. You don't have to make all your money at once. Um, and in fact, uh, the learning curve might be a little more, a little more kind to you if you just keep pressing forward. And I like that he was very calculated in the way he took those steps. Looks like he's jumping back on here, guys. Well, I think, you know, also, I think the work works on you more than you work on it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, <clears throat> I think some people can make money too fast, like JJ was talking about, became first million and mm -hmm. lost it. <laughs> you know, that's pretty common. So, um, what's up, JJ? You back? 
I'm back. I think we had a cloud or something on the Starlink, so it's okay. I made it. <laughs> no problem. Flocking. What were you uh what were you saying about I guess it was about my stuff or something? Nope. Got another cloud. Dun dun dun. There you go, that's better. Yep. Yeah, we can we can hear you well now. You can go ahead and turn it off this computer. Yeah, go ahead and turn off your video. I think that's probably what's messing you up a little bit. We can hear you. It's a podcast, so it's all good. <laughs> yeah. As long as the audio is crisp. Right. One, two. Mic check. Yep, there you go. Yep. Can hear you good. All right, so... My thought was always having the highest price is what's going to bring back the customer. And if you make $10 or $40, you know, it's better to make $10 because they might come back five times. Um, that's really kind of touching the top instead of, you know, the profit in between. And the high price, you're really taking away that option of having a conversation with the customer. So the flip side there is the consumer side. When Good they're point. going around looking for something, they don't want to talk to you. They want to see a price, you know, so it really takes and gives both ways. So that comes to the A-B testing that you're going to do, you know, with ads. So obviously when you get to the point of, I always tell people like uh, you're shopping around for a transmission, uh, you're going to call several places, you're going to get several prices. Somebody's going to make you feel good in the middle range on price and you're going to go with them. You're going to go with them because they made you feel good because your car is very important and you need to trust who's going on with that transaction. The phone is really kind of the new car here. So you're going to call around, you know, the dealership's going to be the most expensive and most people aren't well enough off to just say, yeah, I don't care about money. I need the best. They're going to look around for a deal. So we have the A and the B, right? A is we've got our strong price. Come on in and, you know, sell it. And I, I always thought that's kind of the stronger way to go. But this downside there is you don't get to talk to the person and make them feel good. And that comes back to what I was opening up in the beginning is that empathy, you know, so if you've got the customer that you can speak with, that's great. And what I think that should really happen there is you try and get the quote over the phone. Now, in that instance, the first round, if that fails, then maybe you follow up with, okay, here's our price offer. And then you can show them either the price sheet or you show them a different part of the website that's going to have that price quote to see if you can win them over that way. Because everybody, you know, works and learns a little differently. Everyone communicates a little differently. So you want to try and just give as many different options to educate them on your offer as you can. Yeah, I agree with that. Oh, chop it up again. <laughs> oh, no. Well, you're back. Yeah, I no, I, I understand. Make, what you're... I think I'm going to have to get <laughs> no, You're all good. We'll finish up here in a couple of minutes. Um, but no, I do, I do like what you said there, that's one reason we, um, that's why we give the offer so quick, right? Is like, we only ask, and I say this all the time. I, you know, exactly what you just said. The person is only looking for a price. That's all they're looking for. They don't want, um, they don't want to talk to you. They don't care, honestly. Um, <laughs> they just want a price. So whenever it comes to the advertising, the way, the way I always say it when it comes to negotiation is, you only need to ask two questions to, to make an offer. And then it's the customer's job to give you more details. So, um, for example, you know, we ask, what what device do you have? What's wrong with it? That's it. Then we make an offer. Like if it's an iPhone 14 Pro Max, we make the offer as, knowing that it's a 14 Pro Max. It's probably carrier lock because we live in America. And, um, and then it, it falls upon, in my opinion, the customer to give us more details, but it's our job to dig deeper too. Mm -hmm. So that that's my personal thing. And that's just how I've done well, honestly. Um, I make the customer sell me on why they should get more money. <laughs> Cause I think if I give the highest price too quickly, I lose out on a lot of profit in the middle. Yeah. I think you, well, you don't run ads. So, um, and that, <laughs> You just make, you just lowball people. But, uh, oh, we lost them again. Yeah, we'll probably wrap up here shortly. Um, his Starlink isn't doing too well, apparently. But that's okay. 
Um, I wanted to bring him on here anyway. Do what? Some good sound bites. Some good, good oh, takeaways yeah. from that conversation. Absolutely. So we'll uh, bring him back on here. He'll say his goodbyes, and then uh, we'll wrap it up today. It'll be a short one today for you guys. Uh, but JJ is super smart, guys. Um, he's been in the industry for, he was telling me, 20-something years. Um, so um, definitely reach out if you want, like, a buyback website from him, like a full-on buyback website. Uh, we're working on something with Resell Deck, possibly, um, and, you know, bringing that into the fold. But outside of that, um, you guys can check out his stuff, stuff in the first comment. We'll put it there on YouTube. That way you guys can check it out, reach out to him, and, uh, you know, get your, you know, get your business started. And if you guys are looking for a way to generate leads, make money, and do it quickly in the reselling game or the phone flipping game, um, you guys can check out our stuff, which is Resellerator. Uh, we just onboarded a student this morning, or this week, actually. He went through all three onboarding calls, and... Um, what was it? Uh, Elicio, right, Matt? And he, yeah. found he already bought three consoles. He bought a phone already based off of Aaron's reach out. And then uh, he got his Google ad set up today. So um, awesome. you can, things can happen very quickly when you got the right team. So uh, what's up, JJ? You back? I'm back. <laughs> All right, well, we're going to wrap it up anyway. Um, I was just letting him know where to find you. Uh, we're going to put... Uh, your website and everything in and your Facebook. I'm gonna put it, you do most of the stuff on Facebook, huh? I'm on Facebook and LinkedIn, yeah. Okay, okay cool. We'll put your Facebook that way they can easily contact you. We'll put that in the first in the first comment below, guys. Um, that way you guys can reach out to JJ. You can ask him questions about his stuff. Um, he's got a lot of really good stuff. He's a super smart dude. If you want a buyback sheet built for you. Um, that, you know, go, this is what me and Aaron did with Mercury Electronics. Um, we have it linked to the direct buyers that we basically want to match or beat or whatever. Um, and it automatically updates for us, which is pretty cool. Um, so I know JJ helps a lot of direct buyers in the space. So if you're somebody that's looking to get into that space, you're probably going to want to reach out to JJ because he's the only one that honestly that I know of that does anything like that. So um, anything you want to say, JJ, before we wrap up or how to reach you or any info they should know? Uh, just find me on Facebook. Uh, we'll get the links in there. I'm happy to follow up and I'll give you guys uh, kind of the lead funnel as we go through there. I got a lot of videos and explainer things that go through here. And um, yeah, uh, if you guys haven't signed up with Chris yet, keep an eye on what he's doing. He's got some really cool stuff working here, too. I'm seeing nothing but wins in the group, and uh, I highly recommend it. Love it. Appreciate that. <laughs> All right, guys. I'm going to wrap this one up today. You guys reach out to JJ um, and uh, check out the other podcasts that we've had recently. We've had some bangers on. Recent, definitely recommend looking into Brandon, uh, who's 19 years old, who's, who's on his on track to do over 300,000 in profit this year, maybe more. Um, and we recently had Nivon on who did $43,000 in profit, not sales profit in 90 days. So uh, there is still money to be made flipping electronics guys. It's not it's something that was a, a fad two years ago and there isn't much competition. So jump in. <laughs> so see you guys later. This has been another episode of the smart flip. See you guys later.